from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm Stephanie Marcus from the Science, Technology, and Business Division here at the library. I want to welcome you to Cassini's Grand Finale. It sounds sort of like a symphonic piece, and it probably is with a loud crash at the end. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, we are really lucky to have one of the Cassini team members here today so close to Cassini's demise, which will be a week from Friday, the 15th. Um, Connor Nixon is a space scientist from NASA Goddard. He is originally from Belfast and was educated in the UK. Um, he, has, he, was, he earned a BA in Natural Sciences from the University of Cambridge, a Master of Science in Radio Astronomy from the University of Manchester, and finally his PhD in planetary science from the University of Oxford. He's been with the Cassini mission since his graduate days, and he is, um, he's had many awards at NASA. The latest was the Robert H. Goddard Award for Exceptional Achievement in Science. We have 13 years of Cassini observations, highlights, and the grand finale to get through. So please help me welcome Connor Nixon to the library. Thank you, Stephanie, for such a gracious uh, introduction. And thank you for the invitation to come here. I'm really excited to be here at the Library of Congress, my first time in this building, and to address you all and convey the excitement that I have for this mission that I've worked on for more than 20 years. And it's now coming to a dramatic end. I'm sure some of you have heard next week. This is coming up really fast. So today, I just want to talk about some of the exciting highlights that we've had from the mission so far. It's been a great voyage of discovery. And then take you right up to the present day and talk about what we've done in the last few months and weeks and what's going to happen in the next uh, eight days. So firstly, I just want to introduce Cassini. So Cassini is actually the Cassini, we call it the Cassini-Huygens mission. It's actually two spacecraft. And uh, one was produced by NASA. This is the Cassini orbiter, which is currently in orbit around Saturn. And then there was a probe, which was built by the European Space Agency, named Huygens. This was named after a Dutch scientist, was the discoverer of uh, the giant moon of Saturn called Titan. And this was attached to Cassini. And shortly after it arrived in the Saturn system, the end of 2004, it was released. And this became the first probe to land on the moon Titan. And that gave us a whole different insight into what was going on on Titan. Uh, that mission was uh, short in duration. It was just a two and a half hour descent to the surface. And then that uh, probe, the Huygens probe, its batteries uh, uh, were used up. But since then, the Cassini orbiter has continued with its 12 instruments to give us the uh, science that we've had. So how did Cassini get to Saturn? This was launched back in 1997, and the Cassini spacecraft was so big that we couldn't just push it on a direct trajectory all the way to Saturn. So we had to use a trick, and the trick that we use is to get a slingshot from some of the inner planets. So Cassini actually flew by uh, Venus a couple times and by the Earth, and then finally, it winged its way out to Jupiter and got its final slingshot maneuver to give it that extra boost, that extra kick to get it all the way out to Saturn. So after a seven-year cruise, Cassini reached Saturn in July 1st, 2004, and then it burned its rocket engines for about 70 minutes, and it braked and slowed itself down so that it could go into orbit around Saturn and begin its voyage around Saturn and the moons. On the way, of course, we were able to get glimpses of Venus and Jupiter, and this proved to be very useful for us because we're actually able to test out all our systems. And we got a lot of great science actually out of um, Jupiter as well. This was the launch. It was uh, almost uh, 20 years ago. And it was a fantastic launch. It was a night launch. I was lucky enough to be there. I was still a student at the time, but it was a really exciting uh, time to wish uh, Cassini well on its way. 
And then as you can see, seven years later, uh, it burned its uh, rockets to go into orbit out Saturn. So the Cassini mission was originally designed to have a four-year lifetime from 2004 to 2008. But 2008 came around, the spacecraft was still in robust good health, every system was working, we still had half our fuel left. So we continued the mission for two more years to see the uh, equinox at Saturn. And then at that point, we were extended for another seven years to go all the way to 2017. And this was calculated to be the end of the mission when we've used up all our fuel and there's nothing left in the tanks. So we have to uh, end the mission at that point. And this has been really great because as you can see in this graphic here, Saturn has very long seasons. So Saturn takes uh, 30 years to go around the sun and so it's 30 times as long as the, as the year that we have. And that means that its seasons are about seven and a half Earth years in length. So just to see one season, you have to be there for seven and a half years. Well, Cassini has been uh, in orbit for 13 years. So that's almost two full seasons. And that's given us the chance to see the spring and the fall reverse between the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere on Saturn and also its moons. So here's where we are today. We're right at the end. And I really love this graphic. There's a lot of information packed in here. <clears throat> and this really summarizes what we've done in the entire mission. <clears throat> so at the top, you can see the, uh, the orbits that we've had, the shape of the orbits, as Cassini has gone from more of an equatorial orbit at Saturn to more of a polar orbit. The orbits have tilted up and down so that we can see different things. The, uh, the large yellow circles you see up at the top half are these Titan flybys. So these are flybys of Saturn's largest moon, Titan. And then below that, you can see flybys of Enceladus, a moon which I'm going to talk about. And some of the other icy satellites, uh, Saturn has um, 62 known satellites at last count. And Cassini has discovered several of those new ones. So a lot of, a lot of satellites ranging from very large, uh, Titan is the largest, 5,000 kilometers in size down to very small ones, just a couple of kilometers. And at the bottom here, you can see the seasons changing in the Northern Hemisphere from uh, winter to uh, spring and now to summer. And right over on the very uh, uh, right hand, sorry, right over on the very right hand side, you can see these, uh, I don't know if I can use my pointer, but here you can see these, uh, what we call our final orbit. So we had uh, uh, 22 of these uh, final orbits, and we're right now approaching our very last orbit. Okay. Just some uh, great facts and figures here. I'm not going to talk about all these, but uh, Cassini has traveled billions of miles. And the thing that, uh, that I find the most exciting is the number of scientific publications, uh, nearly 4,000 at the time that this was written, scientific publications have come out of this mission. So it's really been a fantastic mission. So I want to start by showing you a few highlights of the, of the Cassini mission during the 13 years that we've had. I want to begin with uh, one of Saturn's smaller moons, and this is Enceladus. This is 500 kilometers in, in size, or 300 miles. This is what the moon Enceladus looks like. It's named after uh, one of the titans from mythology, as some of its uh, sibling moons are. And you can see that Enceladus, it's a very bright object that's not covered in sand or dirt. It looks like an icy material. It's one of the brightest, most reflective objects we have in the solar system, almost like a billiard ball. And if you look towards the bottom of the image here, you'll see these uh, blue uh, cracks on the surface here. And there are four of these long uh, uh, streaks or cracks. And um, Cassini has been, uh, Cassini got the very first view of these cracks. And shortly afterwards, we were able to discover something uh, very dramatic about Enceladus. <clears throat> so as Cassini flew by Enceladus, we discovered that it was disturbing Saturn's magnetic field. And you can see here in this image that these magnetic field lines, which should be shooting right past Enceladus, were being deflected. And this was indication that there was something going on here. And in fact, When Cassini turned its heat sensing cameras on Enceladus, we could see that these uh, cracks, which appeared to be these blue streaks in the, to the visible cameras, were in fact glowing warm with heat that were uh, 
tens of, of degrees warmer than the cold, cold background. So this was a really exciting indication that there was something uh, unique about the south polar area of Enceladus. And when Cassini turned its cameras back towards the sun, we were finally able to see what was really going on here. In fact, these uh, cracks on the south pole of Enceladus are shooting material out into space like uh, fountains or geysers, just, uh, just like Old Faithful. Some people on the project like to call these uh, Cold Faithful. So, because uh, unlike the, the Earth, of course, this material is much uh, colder. It's, uh, we believe that it's water that's shooting out into space, but it's instantly turned into uh, ice crystals. And these are shooting for tens or hundreds of miles out into space all the time. So you can see looking back towards the sun, these uh, jets, which are not easily visible, you can see them with the sunlight reflecting through them. So this has shown us that Enceladus is one of the very few places in the solar system that's actually an active, geologically active world. And we were very excited to discover this and to find out some more about what's going on here. So just some uh, other images of the plumes here. We can see that these four, uh, four predominant uh, plumes are tracing out the four cracks that we have on the uh, South Pole. Let's see. So what do we think is going on here? It appears that there's liquid water buried somewhere inside Enceladus. And this moon is kept from freezing solid into a block of ice by the tidal forces that are, that are uh, kind of kneading it like a ball of dough by Saturn itself. So as the moon goes around Saturn in its elliptical orbit, it experiences stresses and compression and tension, which keep keep it warm inside and allow the water to remain uh, liquid under the surface. And of course, the surface on the outside is frozen solid, but there's enough water inside and there's enough pressure that periodically, as the moon goes around Saturn, it's venting water out into space. And this is turning into these um, geysers that we see. So here you can see tiny little black dot right in the middle. This is Enceladus. And what's going on here, it's, it's actually creating its own ring as it goes around Saturn. And this is what we call the E-ring, E for Enceladus. And it's, it's, it's trailing all this ice material behind it. You can see here that uh, it's actually uh, making a kind of a wake, like a darker wake where it's plowed through its own uh, ring. So as it, as it repeatedly goes around Saturn, it creates a, what we call a, to a torus, or basically a donut of uh, icy material. And this is spreading out in all directions. And as it comes back around, it's actually making um, like a wake as it plies back through its own material. And these jets are shooting material out in all directions. And you can actually see some of these jets which are um, shooting the material out. And as some of the material uh, goes ahead of Enceladus, it speeds up as it goes towards Saturn, and some of it trails further behind. So Enceladus is really um, this little 500 kilometer size moon is creating uh, a, cl a cloud that's bigger than Saturn itself. So another look inside Enceladus here. This is what we think is going on inside. We think that it's uh, a, a rocky core but then it's surrounded by this blue layer you can see indicated here, which is where the liquid water is. And on top of this, we have the ice shell. Now this is exciting, not just as a natural geological phenomenon. This could be potentially even more exciting th than that because on the earth, we know that at the bottom of the seabed, right where the uh, volcanic vents are in the mid Atlantic uh, ridges, there's a lot of uh, life, which actually likes to congregate there. And, if the uh, core of Enceladus is indeed warm and it's surrounded by this liquid ocean, this could actually be a similar environment. And this is really exciting because this gives us the potential that uh, there could have been uh, life evolved uh, in here inside Enceladus. This is the uh, deep uh, ocean, uh, mid-Atlantic uh, uh, ridges on the Earth. You can see here that these are geologically active and these create a whole ecosystem of life surrounding these. And right now, we can't see that far down inside Enceladus. All we have to see is these plumes of material which are shooting out into space. But this is kind of like a free sample. And Cassini has been able to fly repeatedly through 
these plumes at first we didn't go too close but eventually we got down to just going a few tens of miles above the surface and shooting the spacecraft through these curtains of material and using an instrument on board Cassini to actually measure the material and we found some really fascinating uh, things about the material that it's not just water in fact it contains organic substances uh, methane and ethane molecules there's also salt contained uh, potassium and sodium grains and there's even larger uh, organic uh, pieces. So there's now uh, a huge amount of excitement that's been generated by Cassini to say, let's go back to Enceladus someday. Let's send another mission, but with different instruments this time. We'll have instruments that could actually uh, go through these plumes and maybe look for uh, any evidence of life, any uh, traces of biological material, which Cassini was never designed to find because we, didn't, we did not have any clue that we were gonna find these uh, jets. So this is like a, a free sample from the interior, which is shooting out into space. And in fact, Enceladus is not the only moon either that has liquid water inside. Uh, Cassini has now uh, shown evidence that all four of these larger moons of Saturn are uh, warm enough and close enough to Saturn that they've maintained a water layer inside, uh, including Titan, which I'm going to talk about shortly, uh, Mimas, uh, we nicknamed this one the Death Star for obvious reasons. It's got that... Uh, got that look to it, that mean look to it, um, and Dione, which is one of the other inner moons, and we believe that all these uh, moons have a liquid water layer inside, and, and who knows what's going on inside. So this is really exciting that we've discovered uh, what we call these ocean worlds in the outer solar system, and these may now be our best chance of finding uh, life outside the Earth. So Titan is Saturn's largest moon. I've already alluded to this, and this was a really exciting uh, uh, place to discover. We had the Huygens probe, which descended to the surface in January 2005. But it wasn't until later that year that we were able to make some of the most dramatic discoveries. And in fact, uh, something that was long suspected, but we, we never had the chance to look at before, given its thick, hazy atmosphere, was that there's material that's raining down on the surface. In fact, Titan is the only uh, moon in the solar system that has an atmosphere. A substantial atmosphere. Uh, we have planets that have atmospheres, but Titan is the only moon that has an atmosphere. All the other moons appear uh, just, uh, you can see, all the way to the surface. And on, on, on Titan's atmosphere, the action of sunlight acting on its methane atmosphere creates complex molecules. And in the colder polar regions, these are actually condensing and raining down onto the surface so this is rainfall, but not as we have on the Earth, not water rainfall, this is methane rainfall. And Cassini was the first to see these lakes and seas on the North Pole of Titan. So, th th so these are remarkable. These uh, lakes and seas are about the same size as the Great Lakes that we have in North America. So this largest lake uh, is comparable in size to Lake Superior. And this is containing uh, you know, billions of gallons of hydrocarbons of methane and ethane so these would be like your uh, liquid natural gas and just seas of this material cassini also discovered that titan has has dune fields near the equator but again these dune fields are not the sand dunes that we would see on the earth made out of uh, silicate material these are dune fields made out of little organic uh, dried up organic pieces uh, kind of like almost like little miniature chip, chips of plastic. This, this would be like a, Titan's atmosphere is creating a, a smog, an organic smog, somewhat similar to the smogs that, that are created by um, uh, uh, vehicle fumes on the Earth. We have these uh, you know, famous Los Angeles smogs, and Titan's doing something similar, but in a natural way, and these little uh, particles are coming down on the surface, and then they're getting blown around by the winds, and creating uh, thousands of miles of dune fields. Again, uh, organic material, but this, this time not liquid, but solid. Uh, Titan has some uh, small mountains. Uh, possibly some of these are actively volcanic. It's difficult for us to tell because of this thick atmosphere. And uh, of course, clouds. And when the Huygens probe was able to descend to the surface, land on the surface, it could see that there was dried up uh, rivers and seas that showed us that maybe these organic uh, lakes and seas had been more extensive in the past and now they had uh, retreated towards the polar regions but in the past they may have encompassed the entire planet or uh, much of the uh, low, lower latitudes and um, 
when these first pictures came back, this is actually from the surface. Uh, this, this image here is from the surface of Titan. There's little uh, icy boulders that are maybe just a few uh, inches or tens of inches in size. And when these first pictures came back, uh, the first reaction out at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was, uh, have we mixed this up with Mars? Because this looks like Mars. Uh, but this really was the surface of Titan, and these little boulders are not rocks as they would be on the surface of Mars, but these are icy, icy boulders. You can see here the magnificent uh, imagery that the Huygens probe was able to take as it floated down serenely down to the surface over a couple of hours, uh, actually getting, getting, getting lower and lower. Um, here from 150 kilometers, you can't see anything, you're still in the haze. And then as you descend 30 kilometers, uh, eight kilometers, uh, one and a half kilometers and down to a few hundred meters, you can see uh, this magnificent vista never seen before of this moon. Uh, back in 1980, the Voyager spacecraft flew by, but it wasn't able to see the surface. It didn't have the right cameras on board. Uh, but finally, we were able to see the surface and see these uh, mountains and uh, carved river channels on the surface of Titan. So Titan is the only place other than the Earth you could go to and actually have rainfall. Um, all the, like I said, all the other moons, uh, none of them uh, really have substantial atmospheres. Uh, some may be active. Uh, Jupiter's moon Io, for example, has uh, active volcanology, but it doesn't have an atmosphere. And so Titan's the only place that has a cycle of evaporation, rainfall, and liquids on the surface where you could, you really could just go and if you had a, a spacesuit, you could go and float around on a boat on the surface of Titan. You could take a, you could take a voyage across one of its lakes. And, uh, you know, so who knows what the future holds for tourism <laughs> in that respect. This is one of my favorite images of Titan here. This was looking back towards the sun. And this shows you for real, you can see the glint here of the sun reflecting off one of the, one of the lakes. And I like to uh, tie this together with uh, another world that we're more familiar with, which is the Earth. So you can see that these two bodies, like I said, are the only two places in the solar system that actually have liquids on the surface in the form of lakes and seas. So Titan and the Earth are in some ways, um, very distant cousins. And uh, the exciting thing about Titan is that because its atmosphere is has such great similarities to the Earth, but also differences, um, for example, there's no oxygen, there's no life that we can see, but it may be similar to the Earth several billion years ago when the Earth had newly formed and its atmosphere was really different before the rise of uh, plants that were able to breathe the oxygen into the atmosphere that we now have. The atmosphere of the Earth may have been much more uh, filled with carbon dioxide and methane. And in fact, so Titan may be like a time machine that we can go back a couple of billion years to the early Earth and see what would have been happening in those pr processes. And on Titan, things have just happened so much more slowly because it's so much colder and further from the sun. So now I want to come on to a Saturn. Of course, this is our, uh, this is our, our main guy here in the center of the Saturn system. Uh, such an amazing planet, uh, many people's uh, personal favorite planet in terms of just the drama of the, of the ring system. And here, it's a shame we can't have our front of house lights down a little bit, but I hope you can see that there's actually something going on here in Saturn's northern hemisphere. And this was in fact a huge storm which erupted in 2010, and Cassini was there for a, a ringside, literally a ringside uh, <laughs> seat to see this going off. And this storm erupted. These have been seen in the past from the Earth, but of course much further away. And uh, this storm erupted, and it, it gradually wrapped all the way around the planet. We called this uh, the Dragon Storm because of its initial appearance. And in fact, eventually due to the winds, this gusted this material all the way around so that it wrapped all the way around the planet. And it was like the dragon's head was eating its own tail. And this was really phenomenal because uh, he was able to watch this unfold over several months. Typically, these storms occur on Saturn about every 30 years. This one came about 10 years early. So Cassini was very lucky to be there for its, uh, uh, for its ringside seat to see the storm going off. Uh, you can see here as well the... Um, the, the sun is uh, projecting the shadow of the rings onto the planet. So the sun would be slightly off to the, 
to the north here, projecting through the rings and uh, onto the planet here. So as this storm erupted, Cassini was able to look, using its different cameras, to look into longer and longer wavelengths. You can see here, um, uh, as we see uh, longer wavelengths, we can see deeper into the atmosphere. And in fact, the, uh, the instrument that I work on is the longer wavelength infrared camera on Cassini. And we look at heat, and we were able to see that this storm was glowing uh, 100 degrees brighter than the background of Saturn. So this was a huge uh, uh, warm spot, and uh, this was just uh, throwing off uh, energy that, that was visible to Cassini here. So Saturn's uh, North Pole has uh, even more remarkable uh, stories to tell. If we, if we were able to look right down on Saturn's North Pole as Cassini can, this is what we would see. And you see this remarkable shape emerging here. This was just glimpsed by uh, Voyager as it flew by, but um, Cassini was able to really show us the first picture looking down on Saturn's North Pole. And this is what we call um, the hexagon <laughs> for obvious reasons. This is a wind jet which is circling around Saturn's uh, North Pole. You can see here in the center, this is actually a hurricane uh, eye wall. Uh, this is something very topical this week uh, with all the drama going on in the uh, Caribbean Sea. This uh, hurricane on Saturn's North Pole, this eye wall, is uh, many times bigger than the ones that we have on the Earth. In fact, this uh, circular region here would take up about uh, the entire eastern United States. So this is, uh, this is much bigger. And, and this entire hexagon shape is about twice, uh, two and a half times the size of the Earth. So this is really huge. And the, the winds that are going around here are the fastest that are known in this, in this entire solar system, uh, 300 uh, kilometers an hour. So really fast uh, wind jets here. In fact, uh, people in the Cassini mission are still working to unravel exactly how this six-sided shape emerges. Um, but what we do know is that this is a, a jet stream, which is similar to the jet streams we have on the Earth. And as it, as it goes around the pole, it wavers from side to side. Um, creating this uh, six-sided uh, structure. So let, let's take a look at Saturn's rings. Of course, these are one of the most dramatic features of Saturn. And here's a, a, a primer to the uh, rings. You can see here that the, the brightest, thickest part of the rings, what we call the B ring, and that's uh, uh, sandwiched on either side by the, the A and the C ring. These were named uh, a long time ago by early astronomers. There's a prominent um, gap here, uh, the Cassini division uh, that was discovered uh, back in the, in the 1600s from some of the earliest telescopes. And you can see here there's another gap here uh, in the A ring uh, called the Enki gap. And we now know that there are, in fact, moons that are uh, going around inside the rings that are carving out these channels. And all the way down here, you can see the, the innermost uh, D ring, a very faint ring, which stretches almost down to the surface of Saturn itself. We'll talk about that a little more uh, later. So here's a view of the moon um, Pan. This is one of the close-up views that we just got recently going around inside that, um, that outer uh, Enki gap, which I just showed you. Uh, and uh, so as, as Pan goes around, it's able to clear the material in the rings. And you know, Cassini's cameras have, for the first time, being able to show us close up what these moons uh, look like. Another really uh, fabulous view here. You can see that these rings, even though these are um, uh, almost uh, incredibly thin, just a few tens of yards thick, even though they're uh, hundreds of thousands of miles in diameter, uh, there are places where the material gets disrupted by the moons that are going around and throws up these clouds. So you can see these um, sort of pillars of material, and you can actually see the shadows that they're throwing onto the rings here. And these are being uh, thrown up for tens of, uh, tens of kilometers above the rings, and then they're casting a shadow here, you can see, from the, from the sun. So this shows the outermost edge of the main rings here. This is the, the Enki ga gap, which I just showed you, which has this small moon uh, pan going around in here. And then Right outside the main rings, we have this um, ribbon, 
which we call the um, the F ring. And this uh, ribbon is maintained actually by a pair of moons which go around on either side. And we call those the shepherds. So one is going around just inside the, um, the F ring and one on the outside you can see actually this little guy right here. And as they go around again, they're able to um, to cause some disruption to the um, to the F ring as, as they circle Saturn. So when Cassini was was uh, taking movies of the rings, we were able to see even more uh, structure here. You can see these um, we call these um, spokes or uh, uh, these shadows or spokes in the rings. They look almost like the spokes you'd have on a bicycle, and these are uh, dynamical phenomena again, which are caused by perturbations from the the gravity of the of the various moons going around. But there's a lot of work still to be done to understand exactly how these um, uh, disturbances occur, which cause these uh, periodic thinning and thickening uh, of Saturn's rings. So, Cassini's remarkable 13-year uh, mission is now uh, coming to its last few days. So let's let's go right up to date and look at the um, the activities that are planned for the end of the mission. So during the uh, uh, solstice part of the part of the mission, which was uh, began in 2010 and has taken us up to the present day, this shows you the uh, orbits which Cassini has has made of Saturn. And Saturn, of course, has its has its rings, and these are um, tipped over about 27 degrees. Uh, compared to Saturn's path around the Sun. So Cassini has, for most of its time, remained in this uh, same uh, plane as the rings. But of course, if we... Uh, and that's where the moons are, in fact. So the Saturn system is like a giant... Um, you know, it's like a giant saucer. And many of the moons are going around in the same uh, plane as the rings. So to encounter those moons, Cassini has to go around in that direction. But to see the rings, then, of course, we have to change our orientation. So then we tip our orbits to go over Saturn's poles, and then we can actually look down and see the rings. So over the last seven years, these are the orbits that Cassini has made around Saturn. You can see right in the middle here, uh, periodically going from the, the uh, equatorial orbits to the polar orbits so that we can see different things and changing our, um, changing our, our path each time to encounter uh, many of these distant moons. A lot of these uh, orbits were redesigned after we discovered those remarkable jets or geysers coming out of Enceladus so that we could go back for another look and another look and another look and eventually we went by 22 times uh, just to uh, just to keep looking and trying to sample the material in different ways. And here highlighted in uh, yellow you can see here these are the final orbits. So when we first arrived at Saturn we stayed well away from the rings because these rings are uh, chips of ice, mostly, that are uh, circulating around, but uh, who knows the damage they could do to the spacecraft if we flew through the rings at, uh, you, know, uh, you know, 10 miles uh, per second. This could cause a lot of damage to the spacecraft. Uh, but as the mission has drawn to a close, we've really decided to go for, uh, go for broke and uh, do, do more dramatic things. Uh, so the first maneuver that we did starting in December of last year was to take our innermost uh, orbit much closer to Saturn than we'd ever gone before. And in fact, just to graze the very outer edges of the main rings, and in fact, to go right by this F ring, the one that I just showed you, like a ribbon, and to take a really close look up at the F ring and, and the moons there. And that took us through to uh, April of this year. And then beginning in April, the last uh, five months of the mission, we decided to do something even more dramatic, which was to take a dive right between the innermost ring and the planet itself and this is a gap just a couple of thousand kilometers uh, wide and uh, these are what we call our proximal orbits Cassini is now in its um, uh, coming up to its uh, 22nd orbit right now and these are just six day long orbits so you can see here again we had these um, what we call the ring grazing orbits where we went around and grazed the outside of the uh, the F ring and uh, went around from uh, December of last year through to April. And then we did an encounter uh, again with Titan. So Titan is what we frequently use to give us a little kick, like a little um, change in our trajectory. And then to come into these really dramatic, what we call proximal orbits, actually diving through the gap 
between the planet and the rings itself. And uh, originally we were planning to do maybe a dozen of these, but then we thought, well, how many can we squeeze out of it, right? We, we don't want this to end. So we went up to 15 and then 18, and then finally the uh, mission chief engineer said, okay, you can have 22 and that's it. That's, that's really the limit. Um, your, uh, our, our fuel tank is, is well into the, uh, uh, the empty zone where our, our, our check fuel light is on. We're down to um, less than uh, 3% of our fuel and the margin of error is 5%. So, <laughs> so, so we're, re we're really running on fumes right now, um, but we're confident that we can uh, just uh, finish, finish the mission out. So you can see here in close up just how dramatic it is uh, diving through this gap between this innermost, there's a, a faint D ring here, which stretches down and then just a couple of thousand kilometers where it, where it empties out. And in fact, it's not even really ever completely empty. So in fact, those innermost ring particles, as they get closer and closer to Saturn and they receive the reflected sunlight uh, off Saturn, they actually begin to melt and turn into uh, just water vapor or mist. So Cassini is diving through a cloud of mist as it goes through this gap uh, every time. It's really like going through a car wash every time it goes through this gap. And at the start, we were using our main uh, dish antenna as a protective, um, almost like a, a bulldozer to go in front of us as we went through the, the rings. But as we were um, got more confidence that this uh, material was not going to damage us, we were able to turn the spacecraft and do different uh, pictures, which I'll show you as we as we went through. So here you can see um, this is the surface of Saturn here at the bottom. And then as you go outwards, you go through the rings. So this shows you all the way um, out through the rings. These were the orbits that started in uh, December of 2016. You can see each one of these little blue dots indicating how close we went uh, to the outer rings. And you can see here is the F ring here. And then all the way, and then uh, starting in uh, our April, uh, 22nd, we did our, our kick with uh, Titan and we flung Cassini right into this gap and you can see we jumped right down here. So we're now right down, right above the surface of Titan or of Saturn just dramatically doing these uh, uh, 22 orbits here. And you can see this, this last one here doesn't look too good because this is, uh, <laughs> this is inside the atmosphere and um, that's coming up really, really soon. So I want to show you some of the some of the uh, latest images that we have during these last few months of the mission. Um, here uh, is well, a tiny little moon, um, Daphnis, shown here for the first time, making waves um, as it passes uh, through one of these little narrow um, uh, uh, tracks that it's making uh, the Keeler Gap in the outer edge of the A ring. Uh, someone had a great uh, meme online. If you go and look it up, that says, you know. Um, you know, you, you may be small, but you can still make waves. And uh, it's a really, really great meme. You can go look it up online. So uh, Daphnis uh, doesn't care that it's tiny compared to Saturn. It's still uh, making itself, its presence known. <clears throat> and here uh, uh, you can see February uh, 2017 as we were doing our, um, our F-ring uh, orbits. One of the first looks down on the uh, North Pole of Saturn as it emerged uh, finally in the sunlight for the first time. This had been in darkness uh, during the start of the mission, but we're finally able to look down in full color. You can see this hexagon shape here, which I mentioned here. This is um, 20,000 miles across. And in the center, we have this um, really remarkable glowing blue uh, uh, hurricane system here, which is a um, uh, thousand miles across. Um, one of the fascinating things is that this this hurricane on Saturn's North Pole has actually changed color. You can see here, back in uh, uh, June of 2013, the entire region looked uh, had a bluish tinge to it, while the center um, was more of a, of a greeny orange color. Uh, and then this is reversed. So this shows us that the action of um, of sunlight is actually changing the um, the, the the particles in the atmosphere and uh, causing them, the ultraviolet light from the sun is causing them to change color. Here's a look at Titan from uh, May of this year. Uh, one of the things that we'd been uh, looking for 
as uh, Titan's uh, North Pole went into summer was that there'd be more evaporation, right? So the sunlight hits these methane lakes and there'd be more evaporation. We'd start to see clouds forming and, and, and rain. And uh, it took a long time. It, uh, Titan kept us waiting. But finally, in May of 2017, we were able to see these really dramatic clouds streaking around um, Saturn's North Pole. Here you can see these lakes, these methane-rich lakes on the surface. And these clouds, these are methane clouds, which are going to rain uh, methane back down on the surface. And just when we thought the Cassini had no more surprises, that we'd been in orbit for 13 years, what is there left to discover? We've seen the plumes of Enceladus. We got a close look up at uh, some of these tiny uh, innermost uh, ring, ring moons of uh, Saturn. And lo and behold, they look like pieces of pasta. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, take your pick, uh, a tortellini or uh, a flying saucer. And so these moons, which are just, um, you know, 10 miles across, have this remarkable shape. And in fact, they look almost like a miniature Saturn, right? They have their, their own, it looks like they're, they've got their own little flattened ring around them. But this is, is stuck on. This is, um, it's almost like a tutu skirt, you know, that you would have that's stuck onto these moons. And, it, and it's, um, it's maybe uh, a couple of hundred uh, uh, yards, a couple hundred meters in, in thickness. Um, so it's quite quite strong, quite stable, and this is a um, a coalesced material. So it's a, it's accreted or it's a collected ring uh, ring chips, and as these have collected around the equator of these small moons, they've just all um, coalesced and, and stuck together, and um, you know melted and refrozen and formed this um, almost like a solid ring around it. So you know nobody had predicted this at all until until we were able to um, to take these images. So really. Unbelievable. So what I have here is um, uh, a little short uh, movie clip. This was taken uh, back in uh, April when we did our first close dive over the North Pole of Saturn and our first dive going right down uh, over Saturn and uh, down, to the, down to the rings. And the cameras were turned towards Saturn. So Cassini was basically taking a, an image strip looking uh, over the North Pole and coming down and down. And then right before we got to the rings, we had to turn our cameras away uh, so that we could put our uh, antenna in the forward direction as we pass through the rings for the first time uh, for safety. So we go almost to the equator and then stop. So let me show you this, um, this movie clip here. So this is Cassini flying over the North Pole uh, of Saturn. You can see here, here's the, this, uh, hurricane eye wall storm. Uh, these images are all uh, in black and white. And you can see these uh, other little uh, storm vortices as we passed on over the uh, hexagon, over the outer rim of the hexagon, and then begin to go down uh, across the planet. You can see here we're going over these, uh, these streaks through the outer, outer edge of the hexagon. We're going down over the northern hemisphere. And these were, at the time, the closest images that had ever been taken of Saturn. So we're going from uh, about 40,000 miles away at the North Pole down to just about 4,000 miles. As we come right down, you can see all the structure of Saturn's uh, storms here. And the image track gets narrower and narrower as it gets down towards the bottom. So even um, Uh, more more than uh, nine years after the mission was originally uh, designed to finish, and back in 2008, Cassini was still giving us first-of-a-kind science. It was almost like having a new mission uh, all over again. <clears throat> so you can see here. So here... Uh, Something uh, even more fantastic in many ways. This is looking at the rings from the inside, looking outwards across the rings. So this was taken uh, on August 20th. Cassini, for the first time, um, actually um, kept its cameras going all the way through as it dived between the rings, and it turned its cameras outwards. And what you see here is looking at the rings, and then as they go thinner and thinner, you're actually just looking 
at the ring's edge on from the inside looking out. This is a place that no spacecraft had ever ventured before Cassini did it. Um, and the fact that we're able to, to do this seems, you know, almost uh, uh, miraculous that the spacecraft is still surviving and still returning these miraculous images. Uh, so uh, just some of the uh, amazing facts and figures here you can look up online for Cassini's uh, grand finale. So um, I'm almost finished. Uh, I want to just show you um, a couple of uh, fun cartoons, and I'm going to finish with a short um, uh, video sequence, and then I'll take your questions. Um, so uh, many people have been really motivated by the Cassini mission. In fact, if you go online and look on on, on the web and look on Facebook and Twitter and all these social media accounts, you'll see some of the uh, imagery. People have done their, their own artwork. They've done uh, cartoons. And this is one of the fun uh, cartoons that came up uh, online. Um, so Saturn saying, hey, Cassini, I hear you're retiring in September 2017. Congrats, how do you want to celebrate? Uh, maybe do lunch with me and my moons or something. And uh, Cassini says, no, I'll, I'll just go barreling straight into your atmosphere, learning as much as, I'm, as I can before I'm crushed to death and vaporized in a spectacular whirling inferno beneath your mysterious stormy clouds. <laughs> and, <laughs> and <this laughs> I was like, oh, are you for real? <laughs> it's like, whoa, <laughs> that's awesome. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, no, no retirement for Cassini. He's going to keep working right up to the end. So uh, back in the springtime, um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in California, one of the branches of NASA created a really nice uh, video sequence, which, which I want to show you here. Uh, it's a bit of a tearjerker. People were, uh, there was, when it was shown to the mission scientists, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Um, so I'm going to show that to you right now. This is just a, a few minutes in length, and um, I hope we'll have signed as well for this. So. A lone explorer on a mission to reveal the grandeur of Saturn, its rings and moons. <laughs> After 20 years in space, NASA's Cassini spacecraft is running out of fuel. And so, to protect moons of Saturn that could have conditions suitable for life, a spectacular end has been planned for this long-lived traveler from Earth. Following a seven year journey through the solar system, Cassini arrived at Saturn. The spacecraft carried a passenger, the European Huygens probe, the first human made object to land on a world in the distant outer solar system. For over a decade, Cassini has shared the wonders of Saturn and its family of icy moons, taking us to astounding worlds where methane rivers run to a methane sea, where jets of ice and gas are blasting material into space from a liquid water ocean that might harbor the ingredients for life. And Saturn a giant world ruled by raging storms and delicate harmonies of gravity. Now, Cassini has one last daring assignment. Cassini's grand finale is a brand new adventure. 22 dives through the space between Saturn and its rings. As it repeatedly braves this unexplored region, Cassini seeks new insights about the origins of the rings 
and the nature of the planet's interior closer to Saturn than ever before. On the final orbit, Cassini will plunge into Saturn, fighting to keep its antenna pointed at Earth as it transmits its farewell. In the skies of Saturn, the journey ends. As Cassini becomes part of the planet itself. So there you go. That was grand. <laughs> we can take questions now. And if you would repeat the question so everyone can hear it. Of course. And anybody who has to leave, too bad. <laughs> and, and please take the materials outside. There's some uh, stickers and bookmarks and things from the Cassini project. So Stop. you're welcome to. yourselves and take for friends. Yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. What, do we know anything about it or what's happening on the surface? Does it go all the way down the surface? Is it in the atmosphere? So Saturn really is, is all atmosphere. It doesn't have surface the way what we call the inner planets like Venus and Earth and Mars have a surface. So the atmosphere, it's like Jupiter. It's a, just a big ball of gas. And as you go deeper and deeper into the atmosphere, uh, the gas would eventually turn into a liquid. And then right in the center, we believe that it's um, it's got some weird state of hydrogen where it's like a metal. Um, and then there's probably some rock in the very center. Um, but this storm, it, it, it comes from uh, deep within. We don't know the mechanism right now that's creating it. But uh, like I said, every 30 years or so, there's um, enough energy that gets stored inside. One of the uh, theories is that it's energy that is trapped by water clouds. And eventually this energy uh, gets stored inside until eventually it... Uh, erupts and it, it breaks through the clouds that have been trapping the energy inside and then it erupts and creates this giant storm and then it all begins again the clouds the deep water clouds reform and they trap the heat inside again yeah. okay. yes it's, uh, i wanted to ask about the future i guess and my particular interest is in the plutonium 238 rtg um, but obviously the mission creates more questions than are answered so i'm going to go back and find out more um, and so the two pieces are, one, it, um, uh, you know, I've been, you know, my little area of expertise is producing more 238, and do you feel confident we have enough for more RTGs, for more missions, enough for your missions in the future? And then secondly, what was the discussion going on inside about the idea of um, depositing a little plutonium 238 into another world? <laughs> okay, so the question was um, about the plutonium, and there's two parts to the question. Uh, Cassini's a plutonium or radio, or radioactively powered spacecraft. Do we have enough plutonium being produced for future missions? And uh, the second part was, how do we feel about the plutonium being deposited into Saturn? So, you know, for the first part of the question, traditionally NASA spacecraft in the outer solar system have all been uh, nuclear powered. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft are nuclear powered, both um, Galileo, the mission to Jupiter in the 90s, and Cassini uh, were uh, nuclear powered. So they have a uh, few tens of kilograms of plutonium which are generating heat and this generates electricity. Um, as far as um, future missions goes, right now there's a debate about how much do we need plutonium and one of the things is that due to the uh, improvements in solar technology, it's meant that for some of the applications that we would formerly have used plutonium, uh, we're now ambitious enough to think that we could use solar power. So in fact, the next mission that's going back to Jupiter, the Europa Clipper mission, is actually designed to use solar panels, very, very large um, and highly efficient new generation solar panels instead of plutonium. But for other applications, we still need plutonium. So in fact, the rover, which is on Mars right now, there's this uh, rover Curiosity, uh, originally called the Mars Science Laboratory, which is about the size of a small car that's trucking around on the surface of Gale Crater and trucking up a mountain. 
uh, that is nuclear powered and you couldn't imagine having uh, big enough solar panels that would do that uh, do that mission the previous smaller rovers of course spur an opportunity were solar powered uh, but for missions uh, for example some of the missions that have been proposed have been let's actually go float a boat on the surface of one of these titan lakes now at that level you're so far down in the clouds that you're not going to get any enough solar energy especially not with a small object that can't deploy big solar panels there's even been ideas um, in fact there's a mission just been proposed to nasa for one of its recent competitions that would fly a helicopter on titan actually a quadcopter that would be again about the size of a small car and this is nuclear powered so we do need the plutonium for those uh, missions um, as far as Cassini's uh, plutonium going into Saturn, you know, Saturn is, uh, you know, it's 80 times the, the, the mass of the Earth. Um, the plutonium and radioactive elements that are on the Earth are just a very small part of the Earth. So this is just going to be, um, you know, a few atoms amongst uh, trillions and trillions of atoms. It's not going to make any difference to Saturn itself. Yeah. Yeah, the back of the room. No fear that the Huygens and boats, et cetera, wouldn't contaminate with organic material like the other moons? Right, so the question was uh, any fear that the uh, boats or other missions that we proposed would contaminate um, with organic material. So, in fact, uh, NASA has someone down in NASA headquarters uh, really close to here on the south side of the mall whose job is called planetary protection. And it's not just protecting the Earth from asteroids. It's actually protecting the other planets from us. And uh, missions now that go uh, go out to Mars and to the other planets, um, our whole view has changed compared to what we were doing in the 1970s. And instead of just sending things out there, we're now, we're now very rigorous about wanting to not send little, little gift packages from the Earth of microbes or bacteria, which then might colonize another pristine environment and then we wouldn't find out what we're trying to find out, which, you know, has life evolved there uh, itself? Is it different from the Earth? You know, if we go there and find a bunch of Earth microbes, that's not going to be helpful. So, uh, in fact, that's the reason why the Cassini mission is plunging into Saturn, um, is to protect some of the moons from anything that might still be remaining on Cassini, any microbes that might still have somehow miraculously survived this 20-year uh, mission. Uh, we don't want to have Cassini crash into Enceladus or Titan, where there might be there might be something going on. Um, and in future missions, we're going to take similar protections. So those missions that have been proposed, there was a boat proposed for Titan a few years ago, the quadcopter, as I mentioned, those will have to undergo a very rigorous planetary protection. There's also a study underway right now for uh, a mission which might land on Europa, which is one of Jupiter's moons, which also uh, almost certainly has an ocean inside. And that would land and maybe drill, take some uh, ice cores. And that's going to have very, very rigorous uh, planetary protection on it. Yes. Well, I noticed some of the images of Titan appear to be yellow. Is that a false color? Does it make, is it a black and white image that's been made to look yellow, or is it in fact supposed to show? Yeah, I wish I could. Uh, so the question was, um, is the uh, yellow color of Titan for real? And uh, I wish I could have spent more time talking about Titan. It's actually my favorite object in the solar system. It's what I do most of my own research on um, because it's, it's, um, it appears just like this orange ball and in fact, if you were to look through a telescope uh, from, from the Earth, if you had a, a decent-sized backyard telescope, maybe a 12-inch uh, telescope, you could actually see this little orange dot right beside Saturn. And um, it, so it is orange. It's really orange. In fact, uh, this is what really um, confounded scientists for literally centuries. So when Titan was first discovered, it was called Titan for a reason. And it's because it was thought to be the biggest moon. And it turns out it was playing tricks on us. It's not the biggest moon. It's because it's got a big puffed up atmosphere, which is, um, it actually stretches about a thousand kilometers away from the surface. Because it's got a low gravity, the atmosphere can can stretch out. But the, the orange uh, cloud layers that we see are two or 300 miles above the actual surface. So when scientists measured the size of this dot, they got it wrong because they weren't seeing the surface. And it wasn't until the Voyager spacecraft went by in 1980, it used its radio dish to send back a signal to the earth and as we watched for when that signal got blocked by the surface we were finally able to determine the true size of titan and it's just slightly smaller than one of jupiter's uh, moons ganymede by about 70 kilometers um but it's really close to you know and that's why it's called titan um 
but the uh, the orange color is uh, produced by the action of sunlight on its atmosphere, which is methane. And as the sunlight strikes the methane, it uh, breaks up the the molecule, which is carbon and hydrogen, and then it reassembles it into chains. And these chains form these smog materials. And the smog is the orange material that we see. And um, there's a little bit of nitrogen mixed in there as well. So actually, the atmosphere would be pretty poisonous. It's got a lot of um, uh, carbon nitrogen uh, molecules in there, which we call cyanides. And those are not uh, healthy things to be ingesting. Um, so you get a you get a you get a waft of of almonds probably if you were down on the surface of Titan. <coughs> um, so it, the the orange smog is the um, is the atmosphere and it really is uh, an orange color. Yeah. Is Enceladus the only moon that's actually shooting out water geysers? Are the, the other two ice moons or, or Europa? Uh, are any other moons uh, shooting those geysers? And if Enceladus is the only one, are they only coming out of those four cracks? That it's a really great question. So the question is, um, is Enceladus the only moon that's shooting geysers out into space? And uh, also, are they only shooting out of these four cracks? <clears throat> so uh, back in 1989, when Voyager 2 flew by Neptune, it was able to see uh, some uh, geysers on one of Neptune's moons, uh, Triton. These are um, much uh, smaller in size than uh, what's going on with Enceladus. Um, but we were able to see some... some uh, some vents on on Triton. More recently, there's been a lot of attention focused on Europa, uh, moon of Jupiter. And even though we had a spacecraft there in the 90s and in the early 2000s called Galileo, um, the spacecraft uh, had some uh, technical problems and it wasn't able to get as much data back as we originally hoped. Um, the environment around Jupiter is actually very, very uh, harsh radiation environment. It really, it really just chewed up that spacecraft really quickly. Um, but uh, since then, in the last couple of years, there's been some indications that there may be similar plumes coming from from Europa, actually, which is a similar moon to to uh, Enceladus, although it's it's about seven times uh, wider. Uh, right now, those observations made with the Hubble telescope are really tenuous. You know, we're just seeing maybe just a hint of something, so we're really not sure. There's actually a lot of telescopes uh, observing Europa right now to try and find out if there's a if we can get a better detection of that. Um, but Enceladus is really unique in the sense that it is small and it's got these really dramatic jets, which we can just see every time we fly by Enceladus. We can see these jets. They appear to be coming predominantly out of these four cracks. But the curious thing is that there's other uh, cracks around Enceladus in other parts that are not active today. So what we think is that maybe in the past, the moon has kind of flipped over. So maybe the South Pole was you know, is now the equator, and the equator is now the South Pole. So there were cracks before that were active, but then as the moon has turned on its side, it's created new cracks, and the old ones have, have closed up. So we can see cracks all over the surface that may have been active in the past, but right now it's the ones on the South Pole that appear to be where all the energy is concentrated. Okay, question here. Another great question. The question is, what have we learned about the formation of Saturn's rings? So uh, Saturn, you know, originally we thought Saturn was the only one of the four planets that had rings because they're so dramatic and so obvious from the Earth. Like I said, you can look at the backyard telescope and you can see Saturn's rings. And um, it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, but as the Voyager spacecraft went out, they found that uh, actually Jupiter and Uranus and Neptune all have very, very faint rings, but their rings are different. Their rings are, are dark material. They're like dust rings, whereas Saturn's rings are bright, icy, and they're big. So there's several theories. Um, it appears that Saturn's rings are, are young, and that's why they're still there, because they're not really stable over many hundreds of millions of years. They would um, eventually uh, either evaporate or they would spiral inwards to the planet and they would go away. It may be that uh, Jupiter, uh, the rings that we see at Jupiter and uh, Neptune and Uranus, those faint dusty rings left over, those may be kind of remnants of rings that were more big and bright and icy in the past that have just left a kind of like a faint um, trace now. Um, there's theories that maybe Saturn's rings were created fairly recently by the by the breakup of a satellite. So it may be that uh, there, were, there were more satellites than we see today and two of them, you know, they, they banged into each other, broke up and just stretched this debris ring 
which has been uh, stable for you know maybe tens of millions of years or hundreds of millions of years, but probably not going all the way back billions of years to the start of the solar system. So it may be a transient phenomenon that we're just seeing this ring now. And if we were around in another you know few hundred million years, you know they wouldn't be there. So um, so that's that's one of the theories. But uh, one of the one of the many scientific things Cassini is doing right now. This dive between the planet and the rings is not just purely to get some great pictures. Actually, um, we can measure the deflection of the spacecraft by the gravity, not only the planets, but by the gravity of the ring material. So we can use that to actually weigh the rings and uh, get a better estimate of how much mass of material is in there. And that's going to give us a better estimate as to how young they are. So that's, that's, that's just going on right now, you know, as we speak. Very exciting. Do you have any idea what time of day is going to be yes thank you for uh uh reminding me of that so next friday it will be uh just before 8 a.m i believe on the east coast it'll be just before 5 a.m out in california where i'll be out at the jet propulsion laboratory the uh signal from cassini takes about 83 minutes to get back at the speed of light back to the earth so the times that we're quoting is the time the signal is at the earth the spacecraft when the signal stops on the earth the spacecraft will have died 83 minutes earlier so what cassini is going to do is it's going to keep its um its main antenna pointed to the earth for as long as possible and you saw like right at the end there when it's fighting with its thrusters to try and keep its um, attitude control it's going to try and keep its antenna pointed to the earth as long as possible eventually the atmosphere is going to be dense enough that's going to cause the spacecraft to tumble and then it will lose attitude control that's when the signal will be lost and then a few tens of seconds after that it's just going to be like a meteorite um, or a meteor, it's just going to, uh, pieces are going to start flying off and it's going to, it's going to burn up 30,000 miles an hour in Saturn's atmosphere. You probably have to have a wake, right? <laughs> we have several events planned. Yeah. yeah for next, next Friday. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's going to be getting up really early in California to uh -huh. go down to, um, uh, California Institute of Technology is hosting a big event for about 4,000 people. Oh my. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody who's ever worked on the mission is going to show up. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh my. That's really kind of sad. Well, I guess we should end and get out of the room. Yes. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.